Hi, my name is Jeff Kotz, and I'm going to talk to you about numerical measures in terms of describing data, statistical concepts. If you happen to recognize these PowerPoint slides, it's probably because you have the eighth edition of Basic Statistics for Business and Economics by Lind, Marshall, and Wathan. If you don't happen to have this textbook, hopefully some of these concepts should still apply. The things we're going to talk about today are the differences and similarities between statistics and parameters. We're going to talk about central tendency and dispersion, central tendency being the classic mean, median, and mode. Uh, we're also going to talk about a concept called the weighted mean. We're also going to talk about dispersion, like range, variance, and standard deviation. And, and lastly, we're going to talk about how you can use the summary statistics when you're describing a data set to interpret what the data itself will look like. So first of all, the difference between a parameter and a statistic is a statistic is what you get from sample information, and a parameter is what you get from population information. Remember, you define your population and then take a portion or sample of it. Now, population parameters are what you are trying to estimate with sample statistics. And when you make an estimate of a, a population parameter with a sample statistic, you are making an inference. You use descriptive statistics from a sample to estimate population parameters. Parameters are generally represented with things like Greek letters. For example, mu is the Greek letter that represents population mean. Sigma is the Greek letter that represents population standard deviation. Now, luckily, statisticians decided that they would make these things alliterate. So mu, ma, mean, standard deviation, s, sigma. So we've got some things that make sense, at least in terms of the terminology. Now, statistics are, again, characteristics of sample. They're the things we use to estimate population parameters. We'll see the regular letters that we're used to, things like X or S or P. But generally, we don't have access to the entire population. Populations are huge. Samples are small. So we like to be able to access small things because generally we don't have the resources to be able to get to all the parameter information. Central tendency and dispersion apply to collections of datum, or data, plural, uh, known as data sets. And we use these summary statistics to help characterize the collection of data that we have. We have a bunch of them together. If we have a lot of different data points, I can't tell you about all of them. I'd rather give you one or two or three different things that tell you all you need to know about that set. Central tendency, like mean, median, and mode, describe different types of middles. Dispersion helps us understand how spread out data sets might be. Central tendency are measures of location. And the purpose of a measure of location is to try to get a, a point estimate. And there's many measures of location. We're talking about location, not dispersion. Central tendency is middle. Middle is location. And there's four things, mean, median, mode, and like I said, we're also going to talk about the concept of weighted mean. We'll come back to that. We'll start with the properties of the mean, otherwise known as the average. Uh, every set of interval, interval and ratio level data has a mean. You add up everything and divide by how many there are. It's not something we haven't seen before. All values are included in the mean. Extreme values dramatically affect the arithmetic mean. Third, the mean is unique. Each data set has one and only one mean. Fourth, the sum of the deviations of each value from the mean is zero. So if we look at this balance across the bottom of the screen here, we can see that there are three weights on the balance. Three, four, and eight. If you add three, four, and eight, you get 15. Divide by 3, you get the mean, which is 5, which is where the fulcrum is. That triangle block with the x-bar under it, yeah, that's the mean. So number 4 here says the sum of deviations uh, of each value from the mean is 0. And those are the things that are marked above, the negative 2, the negative 1, and the plus 3. Those are all deviations from the mean, how far each of them is away from the mean, deviation. Negative 2 plus negative 1 
It's negative 3. Negative plus negative is ne negative 3. And, and then we see positive 3 is the third one. You add all those things together, you get 0. You always get 0. You always get 0. The sum of the deviations of each value is always 0. Which leads to point 0.5, which is that the average of those deviations is always 0. Anytime you add them all up, you always get zero. Divide by however many you want, and you've still got zero. I mentioned before, number two, that all values are included in computing the mean, so it's very sensitive to extreme scores. So if we look at this balance right here, and let's say well, we've got a three, and we've got a four, and we've got an eight. If we were to add another one, let's say we, we put it right on top of the 5, well, I'll let you know that it doesn't change the mean at all, and it won't change how this thing balances at all. But, if I were to take a block and extend that balance out, oh, I don't know, 100 marks, and put something out there, this would no longer be balanced. And it wouldn't be off balance a little, it would be off balance a lot it would just turn and flip and fall over really, really horribly. I said at the beginning the difference between a statistic and a parameter is that a statistic comes from a sample and a parameter comes from a population. Sample mean, the symbol for sample mean, is X bar, and that's often how we refer to it. And this definition talks about ungrouped data. Ungrouped basically means it's not in like a frequency table or anything like that. Uh, it's loose. Now the sample mean is the sum of all the things divided by how many there are. A couple of things to point out. First of all, like I said, X bar. X is a regular letter. That's not like a weird looking chi or anything like that. No, it's X. And second, what you divide by N is a small letter N. Sample letters are small letters. Population letters are big or Greek. So if we look at the population mean here, now we're introducing the Greek letter mu, which kind of looks like an M. And we also see that the denominator there is a capital N, which means that it's population size. All we have in these two formulas, you add up all the things and divide by how many there are. The median is the midpoint after they have been ordered from smallest to largest. Two examples here. Uh, the ages for a sample of five college students are 21, 25, 19, 20, and 22. But that's not in order. 19 is the youngest, 25 is the oldest. When you put them in order, 21 is the median, which means half of roughly half of the numbers are below 19 and 20. Roughly half or half, exactly. 22, 25, or above. Now, I say roughly uh, because in some cases we have an odd number of data points here, 5. Now, I say half. Half of 5 is 2.5. Well, 19 and 20 are below, 22 and 25 are above. So it's uh, half rounded. If you have an even number, like the heights of four basketball players in inches, now this is an even number, uh, and we rank the, or we put them in order, 73 up to 80, we could say that the median is not actually a member of this data set. Now, 75.5, which is the median of that data set, is not one of the four heights. It's not contained in the data set, but it does tell you that half of the values are below and half of the values are above that particular point. The mode is the value of the observation that appears most frequently. Here's two examples. Uh, one, we have what looks like a histogram over here and says across the x-axis the number of years that someone has, let's say, been employed at a company. And then the count or frequency is the y-axis. And it appears as though, oh, Somewhere around three years, there is a big spike. There's also a spike at five, but at three, that big spike is our mode. It's the one that appears most often. We could say at this company, most people have been there three years. I said before that the mean was unique, one and only one mean. Same is true for the median, one and only one median. There's one value that will divide it in half. The mode, however, not so much. You can have two modes. You can have two values that occur most frequently. 
In this distribution, 5 is also where we can see a spike. Now granted, it doesn't appear most frequently, but it appears rather frequently compared to some of the other things around it. The mode is really useful in looking at distributions of data like this because they're uh, obvious, they're big spikes, so they're perhaps points across the x-axis that we should investigate a little bit further because it's not smooth like let's say our second example here what we're looking at over here are two graphs that represent hourly production of computer monitors at Baton Rouge and Tucson what we have in the second picture over here is a comparison of Baton Rouge and Tucson two plants that both make I'm gonna guess computer monitors and we observed them for a, a work day which let's say it's nine hours a little bit more than eight you know standard eight let's call it nine hours so there are nine measurements on here represented by nine particular monitors both in purple for baton rouge and yellow for tucson at tucson we saw for three hours of their work day yes they also made 50 monitors per hour so in terms of central tendency we can see that both of these factories had modes that were the same. Both factories seemed to produce 50 monitors an hour most frequently. But if we look at how they're different, we can see that Baton Rouge is pretty close together. Now, Tucson is very spread out. How close together and how spread out things are are concepts of dispersion. And we'll get there in just a little bit. The fourth example of central tendency is an extension of the arithmetic mean that we call the weighted mean. Here's an example. Uh, the Carter Construction Company pays its hourly employees uh, $16, 15 19 and $25 per hour. There are 26 hourly employees, uh, 14 of whom get that $16.50, 10 who get 19 and 2 who get 25 So what is the mean hourly rate paid to the 26 employees. Well, we know that there's 26 people, so we are gonna add up a bunch of stuff and divide by 26 because there's 26 people. But what are the things that we need to add up at this point? Well, we know that there are 14 people who make 1650. So I could say 1650 plus 1650 plus 1650 plus 1650 14 times plus there are 10 people who make $19 an hour. So 19 plus 19, 19, 19, 19, 19 uh, 10 times. You hear me say 10 times? Yeah, that's multiplication, hence 14 times 16.50, 10 times 19. Add up all that stuff and divide by 26 because there's 20 people. Uh, the average employee makes $18.12. That's giving weights to each one of those points, 16, 50, 19, and 25 where the weight is determined by the number of employees who make that amount. We can generalize that to the following. X bar W, or X bar sub W, means mean weighted. X bar is mean, W means weighted. Another example here. Let's say your task was to calculate your GPA. Now you have five classes, statistics, music, western art, theater, and storytelling. These five classes are not all worth the same number of credits. Your stats class is three credit hours. Your music class is three credit hours. Your art class is three credit hours. You've got a one credit theater practicum and a four credit storytelling course. Okay, so far so good. I know that my storytelling course should likely contribute more to my GPA than does that theater course because I spend so much more time in that course. That's the number of credits. Now, your grades, let's say, they correspond to how well you did. Uh, four for an A, three for a B, two for a C, one for a D, and zero for... Well, your storytelling, your theater course, and your Western art course, you all got fours, and you got A's across the board, good work. Uh, you got a C in your stats class, and D in your music class, that's a bummer. You should probably, I don't know, listen to more music and pay more attention to your stats teacher. The way we use that formula here is to take the weight, which is the number of credits, times the grade, which is the value you got for that class. You multiply them together. So three credit hours, 
uh, times a grade of two gets you six. Three credit hours times a grade of one gets you three. You add up all of those things and you get 41. So that's the sum of six plus three plus 12 plus four plus 16. You add all of those up and you get 41. 41 divided by your total number of credits, which is 14, gets you your GPA, your grade point average of 2.93, just below a solid B. That's the classic example of how we're used to seeing the weighted mean. Uh, the weight's based on the number of credits, and the, the grade is the value you get there. Uh, but this example of employees and how much money they make per hour, I think, is another good example. So at this point, we've completed a discussion about point estimates for central tendency, mean, median, and mode, and also extended that conversation to the weighted mean. Dispersion is a whole different class of things. Measures of location, such as the mean or the median, only describe the center of the data. Now, it's valuable from that standpoint, but it doesn't tell you anything about how spread out they are, and that could be critically important. For example, if a nature guy told you that the river ahead averaged three feet in depth, uh, you know, it's up to your chest or your waist, or depending on how tall you are, you know, it's not that bad. Would you want to wade across that river on that information and that information alone? Now, if you did, you're probably falling in a sinkhole because most rivers aren't completely flat. They might have shallow spots. They might have really deep spots. When you average that all out, your average might be three. But that doesn't tell you whether or not it's consistently three or whether it spikes to very shallow and very deep. How much it changes, that's dispersion. And we get things like range, variance, and standard deviation. We can start with range here. Range, very simply, is the largest value minus the smallest value. We can tell you at some point the river may be three inches deep. That's the smallest, and at some point maybe it's 60 feet deep. So this difference between 720 inches and three inches is 717 inches. So our range would be that difference. Or here, smallest value is three, largest value is eight, largest minus smallest, means our range is five. Now the range only takes into account two values, the smallest and the largest. Nothing in between, nothing to account for, whether most of them are somewhere, whether there's a lot of them, whether anything's grouped together. It's only the extreme values. Now it may be that at some point in the river it spikes very deeply, but you can hop over that very, very deep point in the water because it only occurs very briefly. The range is very sensitive to extreme values. However, where we make our money in dispersion is on variance and standard deviation. These two definitions, variance and standard deviation, are very mathematical, but I absolutely like to break these things down verbally. So if something is constant or consistent, it does not vary. If it does not vary, it has no variance. If it has no variance, it's not different at all. And that's our conceptual understanding of variance. Does it vary, yes or no? If something has a large numerical variance, that indicates to us that it varies quite a bit. If it has a zero variance, that indicates to us that it does not vary at all. Our standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So they're directly related. So much so that people will oftentimes in conversation substitute variance and standard deviation for one another because we're essentially talking about the same concept. For the concept of standard deviation, the same way we said before with variance, variance sounds like the word very, very means different. Standard deviation, same sort of thing applies. Deviation tells us how much we deviate. Deviate from what? We'll deviate from the mean. But if you remember the conversation we had about the arithmetic mean, we said if you add up all of the deviations from the mean in a data set, you get zero. 
And if you average all of those, zero divided by anything is still zero. So the concept of an average deviation arithmetically doesn't make sense. You can't take all the deviations, add them up, and divide by how many there are because you'll always get zero. So statisticians had to come up with a slightly tweaked formula about that. We'll see in just a second. The term standard deviation is, to me, verbally a little bit like average deviation, knowing, though, that the average deviation is always going to be zero. Standard means uh, regular. So how much, in general, do values deviate from the mean? If things are spread out a lot, then they deviate a lot. If they are very close together, then they deviate not a lot. They deviate only a little. There's a number of different properties of the variance and the standard deviation. They're all very important. The first one is that the variance and standard deviations are non-negative and are zero only if all observations are the same. That's really two parts. One is that it's always at, uh, at least zero. It can never be negative. And it's zero if everything is the same. Populations whose values are near the mean, the variance and standard deviation will be very small. Let me just discuss that in terms of if things aren't, don't vary very much, they don't deviate very much, then that number will be small. For populations whose values are dispersed from the mean, the population variance and standard deviation will be very large. The variance overcomes the weakness of the range by using all the values in the population. Same thing is true for the standard deviation. So whether you say the variance overcomes the weakness of the range or the standard deviation overcomes the weakness of the range, remember you said a limitation of the range is it only takes the minimum and the maximum into account. It's very sensitive to extreme values because it only takes two values into account. But when you calculate the variance of the standard deviation, you use all the values. So we might have a huge data set where everything is exactly the same, except for one value all the way over there. Because the variance takes into account all of the data, it's still going to be very small. Now, it won't be zero because there is one thing that's different, and it might be very different. But it's still going to be very small because we have a whole bunch of things that are the same. If we compare that to, let's say, the range, the range is going to be large because the difference between the minimum and the maximum is very large. It only takes two values into account. The variance and standard deviation overcome that limitation. Uh, another point here, a lot of these things talk about populations whose values uh, fall within near the mean or not near the mean. You can substitute sample in your understanding for that as well. We can start by looking at sample variance here. Now this is the formula and the steps in order to calculate this. If you want to figure out step by step exactly how to count this, you can follow these steps or look elsewhere. I'm here to talk conceptually about how to understand concepts such as variance uh, and standard deviation. This formula you can see is for the sample variance. It says sample variance right there. And second, we see that the letter S, well, S squared, the letter S is one of our common letters in our alphabet. That means it's sample information. We can see that that N at the bottom is a baby N, which means that it's a sample size. Our population formula uses a sigma. Sigma is a Greek letter, Greek letter, so we know that it's a parameter because it comes from a population as opposed to sample variance, which is a statistic. Mu is also in that formula as opposed to X bar. Mu, another Greek letter, is a population parameter. Third, you can see that it's a capital letter N in the denominator. The capital letter N is another indication that we're talking about population parameters here and not sample statistics. One other difference between these two formulas you can see pretty clearly is that the denominator for the sample variance is N minus 1. The denominator for the population variance is just N. The reason for this goes back a long, 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 long time. But... For small sample sizes, you will notice that sensitivity is very important. 
But if your sample size blows way up on the order of two, three hundred, then it won't really matter if you take one away, if you do n minus one on the bottom. Regardless, these are two specific formulas for sample variance and population variance, and that difference is necessary. Here is an example of how you would calculate this if you wanted to do it by hand. For example, if we say that here are three hourly wages for employees at Home Depot and we wanted to calculate the sample variance, we would need to use the sample variance formula up there and create two columns. First of all, the deviations from the mean. We calculate the mean here to be 85 divided by 5, which I'm going to say is 17. So if our mean is 17, we have this column of deviations, uh, x minus x bar. Now, x minus x bar gives us a minus five dollars, three, minus one, one, and two. We add all those up and we get zero. The sum of our deviations is always zero. That second column, x minus x bar, is the deviations column. In order to calculate the variance, we need to square each one of those deviations, which is the next column, x minus x bar squared. So we take 5, negative 5, and square it and get 25. 3 and square it and get 9. Negative 1 square it and get 1. Because anything squared is non-negative, 0 squared is 0, but negative numbers squared are positive, and positive numbers squared are positive, so non-negative, when we add all those things up, we will always get a positive number. That's how we got around the average deviation or the sum of those deviations being zero. We got around it by squaring it. By squaring it, we force the stuff to be positive. So our third step is to create that column uh, in which we square each of the deviations. We add up get 40, divide by sample size minus one, four, and then we get the variance, the sample variance, of 10. Now the units around that is dollars squared, which is why standard deviation is often more useful, because dollars squared is not a unit that we think about. We take the square root of 10 and we get that number that's slightly bigger than 3. The units on that, no longer dollars squared, is regular dollars. That makes it much more useful. Second, we're going to get to the empirical rule and Chebyshev's theorem. Those things use the standard deviation. Those things use things like dollars, actual units of the things we're operating in. The variance and standard deviation, again, are so closely related conceptually, people will oftentimes use the same words to describe them, or they'll, I'm sorry, they'll use variance to describe standard deviation, vice versa. They're talking about this concept of dispersion that comes from taking the sum of the square deviations and dividing by the sample size. Whether or not you take the square root in order to get back to regular units, not dollars squared, just regular dollars, whether or not you're doing that, the concept is still the same. and It's the larger concept of dispersion. So up until this point, we've talked about central tendency and dispersion. Uh, we've talked about how those things can help us understand uh, particular aspects of a data set. But let's say I came to you with just those things, just the mean and just the standard deviation. What could you tell me about the data set as a whole? Again, yeah, we've used them to summarize the data set. We said the data, data sets are huge, complicated, clunky things, which is why we need to simplify them by providing a couple of summarizations. In other words, uh, we've made sense of these big heaps of data by providing those summary statistics because we can reduce that complexity of all of those data points into just a handful of things like your mean and your standard deviation. But we can also use those summary statistics to help us understand what that big mess, that big heap would look like. The two things that we can use to do that are Chebyshev's theorem and the empirical rule. Those two things have very specific uses. I might argue that the empirical rule is more powerful than Chebyshev's theorem, but you'll be able to decide that for yourself. Chebyshev's theorem works for any distribution. 
The empirical rule only works for normal distributions. Now this distribution on the left, uh, that shape might look familiar. That was the example that we used when we were talking about the mode. Now that's not a normal distribution. It looks a little bit normal, but it's got a couple of modes. It's what we call bimodal. It's got two spikes. Across the bottom on the right there, we see that smooth curve. Now that bell-shaped curve is the normal curve. So for normal distributions, we can use the empirical rule. But we can use Chebyshev's theorem for any distribution. Now if we can use Chebyshev's theorem for any distribution, why do we even bother with the empirical rule? The reason is quite simple. The empirical rule gives us much more precise understanding of a data set than does Chebyshev's theorem. But because the empirical rule only applies to certain distributions, we can't use it all the time. Fortunately, when we say that it applies to normal distributions, normal distributions got that name because they occur regularly, frequently, so the empirical rule only works for normal distributions, for a symmetrical bell-shaped frequency distribution like this. Approximately 68% of the observations will lie within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. About 95% will lie within two standard deviations of the mean, and three standard deviations get you 99.7%. Now, first off, those numbers, 68 95 and 99.7 are critical. They are the important numbers that you must commit to memory for the empirical rule. It applies to all normal distributions. So here in this distribution that you can see, uh, I'm going to say, you know, in the middle there, the mean, which in this distribution is also the median and the mode, it's all the same. The mean is 100. So if I wanted to know in terms of frequency, what proportion, what proportion of this data lies within one standard deviation of the mean, I would know it's 68 percent. So let's say in this distribution that the mean, that middle point of central tendency is 100. And I'm going to declare to you that the standard deviation is 10. So if I go one standard deviation below, we get to 90. One standard deviation above, and we get to 110. Between 90 and 110, we will find 68% of the observations that compose this data set. In other words, if there were 100 people in this data set, 68% of them would score between 90 and 110. Two standard deviations... So plus or minus 2 times 10, 100 minus 20, or 100 plus 20. Between 80 and 20, 80 and 120, we'll find 95%. 95% of the observations. Again, if there's 100 people, that's 95 people between 80 and 120. Three standard deviations, so 100, 90, 80, 70, 100, 110, 120, 130. Between 70 and 130, we will find 99.7, or practically all the observations in our data set. Now that last one's pretty key, because it tells us even more. It tells us if something is three standard deviations away from the mean, either below or above, and it's a normally distributed data set, that thing is quite different. It occurs very rarely. I don't expect anything to be out that far away from the mean. I expect most things, 99.7% of things, to be no further away than three standard deviations above or three standard deviations below. If someone rolled in here and said, I got a 150 or I got a zero, I would be pff, mind blown because that's five above or 10 below. Sometimes people will say standards. So it's a five standards above or 10 standards below. I, don't know, I say standard deviation. Why not? Regardless, that distance tells you about how many people are inside. Hey, look at that. Take a moment and look this over. It is what I just said. I'll wait. Chebyshev's theorem. 
Now, empirical rule only applies to normal distributions. But Chebyshev's theorem does something similar to what the empirical rule does, but A, it works for all distributions. B, it's not quite as specific. It's not quite as precise. Remember, for the empirical rule, 68, 95, and 99.7. Commit those to memory. But for Chebyshev's theorem, we actually have a formula that we use. So we'll start with the example here, which is talking about the Dupree paint plant. Uh, they've got a profit sharing plan. Uh, the mean biweekly amount contributed to their profit sharing plan is $51.54. Ha! The mean. The mean, the central tendency is 51.54. And the standard deviation is $7.51. $7.51. Cool. So we've got the same stuff that we had like we did in the empirical rule problem. Except for one key thing. Nowhere in this problem does it declare that this is normally distributed. In order to use the empirical rule, it will have to state explicitly that the distribution is normal. If it doesn't say that it's a normal distribution, you can't apply the empirical rule. You can always apply Chebyshev's theorem. So here's another way that it's different from the empirical rule. The empirical rule gave us 68, 95, and 99.7. That's awesome. But it also said one, two, or three standard deviations above below. That's it. For Chebyshev's theorem, we get to use it for any distribution, and we get to choose the number of standard deviations, 3.5. Here's the theorem. For any set of observations, the proportion of values that lie within k standard deviations of the mean is at least 1 minus 1 over k squared, where k is any constant greater than 1. Let's take it apart. Formulas at the bottom there. K, K is your number of standard deviations. K has to be greater than 1. Has to be greater than 1. If you wanted to find out something about you know, half a standard deviation, you got nothing. If you want to find one standard deviation, well, if K is 1 and you go into that formula, you drop 1 in there, you get 1 minus 1 over 1 squared. Well, 1 squared is 1. 1 over 1 is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. Yeah, you do the math for k equals 1 and you get some number that says 0. That's not really all that useful. Also, Chebyshev's theorem says it's at least. For a normal distribution, the empirical rule, we said it is 68, it is 95, it is 99.7. Here, we're talking about at least. So we complete this problem as given in this uh, um, in this example. So fifty-one dollars and fifty-four cents. We want to go three and a half standard deviations above and below. Well, fifty-one dollars and fifty-four cents, three and a half standard deviations. Uh, what is that? Fifteen dollars twenty-two fifty. Some more out. So if we do some rounding here, uh, we're really talking about uh, about fifty-one dollars and fifty cents going up about twenty-six dollars and below about twenty-six dollars. Really rough rounding, but we're saying somewhere between twenty-six dollars on the low end and then seventy-seven dollars on the high end. Roughly three and a half standard deviations. I did a lot of rounding there. What's important with Chebyshev's theorem is k is the number of standard deviations, because that's the only thing you put in that formula. Just telling you, the problem might that you see might not be, here's a mean and here's a standard deviation and here's a number of standard deviations. I might give you something like, the mean is 5150, on the low end it's 26, on the high end it's 77. You have to calculate that that's three standard deviations below and above, or three and a half standard deviations below and above. Ah, you calculate that K is 3.5. Let's get to the formula already. You put 3.5 in there. You calculate it out and you get 0.92 or 92%. The way we would say for this problem is that at least, given this theorem, this information, at least 92% of our observations lie within 3.5 standard deviations from the mean. At least 
92% of contributions lie between $26 and $77. It could be 100%. It could be all of them. But it's no less than 92 well, if this were a normal distribution, we could use the empirical rule. And while we can't do 3.5, we could do 3. 3 standard deviations using the empirical rule would tell us 99.7. Practically, exactly 99.7. It's 3 standard deviations above and below. But this distribution is not normal. We asked for 3.5 standard deviations. And we're ha we have to translate this to at least as opposed to exactly. That's how those things differ. So in some regard, the empirical rule is more powerful than Chebyshev's theorem because it provides specific proportions. Exactly 68, 95, 99.7. However, Chebyshev's theorem is more powerful uh, in some regard because it can be used on any distribution. As long as you're given a mean uh, and some standard deviation, you can tell me about the number of people within a particular range. If you recognize this data, this is that household income data from hours ago. What I'm now going to do is go through a series of different ranges to help you understand how Chebyshev's theorem can be used here. First off, we know we can't use the empirical rule. Why? Because this distribution is not normal. It's a skewed distribution. It's positively skewed. Uh, spoiler alert, it's positively skewed because the tail is on the positive side. Or you can think of it the right hand rule. The palm of your right hand is positive. The knuckles of your right hand are negative. If the tail is on the positive side, it's a positively skewed. Anyway. This is not a normal distribution, so we can't use the empirical rule. But we can use Chebyshev's theorem because we can use it on any distribution. We need to start with saying, well, what's the mean and how many standard deviations away? We go back to the mean of that distribution we said is uh, about 63,000, and that's what that red line represents. And the standard deviation, let's say, was calculated out of that uh, data to be 15,000. Now that wasn't on that graph. I half interpolated, half fictionalized. First of all, you couldn't tell me about between 63 and 78,000 because the mean is not the middle of that range. You couldn't tell me about the proportion between 48 and 78,000 because that's one standard deviation. If you take 63 and add 15, you get 78. You take 63 and subtract 15, you get 48. So that would be the range between 48,000 and 78,000. Exactly one standard deviation, which means k is 1. And you can't do Chebyshev's theorem if k equals 1. k has to be greater than 1. But what you can do is the last one. You could tell me if you chose two standard deviations. The 75, at least, at least, is key in Chebyshev's theorem. At least 75% of people make between 33,000 and 93,000. In this video, we talked about the difference between sample statistics and population parameters and how you use sample statistics to estimate population parameters how sample statistics use regular letters and population parameters use uh, Greek letters, or statistics use small and parameters use big letters. We talked about central tendency, mean, median, and mode, as well as the concept of the weighted mean. All of these are different access of the middle. Dispersion, how spread out things, how much things vary. Range, variance, and standard deviation. Range is very sensitive to extreme values, and the variance and standard deviation overcome that by including all values in your data set. And lastly, we talked about how you can extend from just those summary statistics, your mean and your standard deviation, to tell me about proportions of observations or responses within your data set using the empirical rule for normal distributions only. And Chebyshev's theorem for any distribution provided k or standard deviation is greater than 1. That's it out of this chapter. I hope you learned something. Perhaps I'll see you again. Toodles.